Amen. Thank you to our celebration choir. I hope you noticed we had our children leading us as our praise team with our adults and up in the choir loft this morning. And uh, as uh, the second graders and below head to kids worship, it just reminds us of the way you make an investment in younger generations, and that's so important. And them singing and worshiping along with us, that's a, that's a great thing. Uh, and glad to see that this morning. Uh, today I want to continue our message series on the eight traits of a healthy church. So I invite you to take the listening guide. Hopefully you found when you picked up the proclaim or one was handed to you as you came in the room today. Uh, eight traits of a healthy church. is uh, We're looking at two churches in the book of Acts. The first 15 or 16 chapters kind of orbit around what's happening in Jerusalem and Antioch and the two churches that were uh, uh, headquartered in those two first century ancient cities, drawing out characteristics of what made them healthy and vibrant and strong. And we've already worked with the first five, and so in case you missed some of those, let me t- remind you what they were. And every one of these messages is uploaded to our church uh, video uh, watch page, and you can find that easily on our church website. Uh, but the first five traits we've discovered uh, number one is that a healthy church is led by the Holy Spirit. All throughout the book of Acts, you see the Holy Spirit leading people to do this and do that. And even today, if the Holy Spirit doesn't lead us, we don't need to do it. And let's don't do anything He doesn't lead us to do. But we need to make sure we do everything He's led us to do. Healthy churches are led by the Holy Spirit. Second thing we learned is a healthy church makes disciples. What good is all of our programs and our activities if we're not making disciples? That's what they did in Acts that's what we need to do today. The third trait is a healthy church creates community, a sense of togetherness, that we're in this together, that, that relationships and, and connectedness are so important. The fourth trait is a healthy church embraces change. Now, change is difficult. I don't like change. You don't like change. And most Baptists definitely don't like change. <laughs> but change is coming whether you want it or not. And so a healthy church embraces the change to use it for God's glory. The fifth thing we considered last week is a healthy church uh, demonstrates unity, a sense of oneness. Remember, unity is oneness in spirit, not unanimous in a vote. One spirit, one heart. You can have difference of opinions of people and still have a oneness uh, together with that brother and sister in Christ. Today, the sixth trait of a healthy church is uh, found in chapter 13, that it focuses outwardly. So in chapter 13, we have a turning point in the life of the church at Antioch. Indeed, what happens in Acts chapter 13 is a turning point in the history of Christendom. This is a major moment that's about to happen in Acts chapter 13 as they turn their focus to those who are outside and beyond them. Chapter 13, it says, Now the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, that Saul of Tarsus, the former Pharisee. Later on, we'll call him Paul the Apostle. Verse 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit, there he is again, (laughs) The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And thus began not only the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, but it began the missionary heartbeat of the New Testament church. That's why we send missionaries today. That's why we go across the world and we go across the street. Because the news we heard, the news we have found is too good to keep to ourselves. This church in Antioch is a great example. Their life had been changed by the grace of God. Their life had been turned upside down and inside out. They found something good. They found something eternal. They found something that gave them peace and and hope and, and forever. But they realized the call of Christ was not to keep it to themselves, but to spread it far and wide. And the church at Antioch sent them out because they didn't want to just keep it to themselves. Indeed, the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts goes on three missionary journeys around the known world. The first one is in chapters 13, 14, and 15, and then chapter 16, 17, tell uh, missionary journey 2 and 3. 
On his second missionary journey, Paul takes the gospel into Europe. In the third missionary journey, he retraces some of his steps. But all three missionary journeys began in the same place, right here at the church in Antioch. Because they knew God's call for them was God's call for them. And the gospel of Jesus Christ was pushing them outward. They realized that this news of Jesus wasn't just for them and their friends and no more. That the call of Christ, the the command of the gospel was not to circle their wagons and take care of one another, but to go across the street, go across the globe, pushing outward with the wonderful life-changing news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even today, healthy churches, healthy churches know we're not to circle our wagons and take care of the comfort and the conveniences of our members but to take this life-changing gospel story of Jesus and take it across the globe or take it across the street. Why is that important? Why are we compelled to focus outward? And why does a healthy church in Statesboro, Georgia in the year 2019 have an outward focus? Well, one reason is because of who we are. Because of who we are, I don't mean because we're a First Baptist Church or because we're a Southern Baptist Church or because we're a historic legacy church, been here for 136 years. I mean because we are the people of God. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Salt, salt, if salt has no flavor, if it's not being used, you might as well just trample it underfoot, Jesus said. And who lights a lamp and puts it under a basket to hide the light, you put it on a lampstand so it sheds the light everywhere. That's who we are. We're not called to keep it to ourselves. We're called to take it outside and beyond. This church at Antioch knew that they were a special people. Remember in chapter 11 it says the Christ, they, they were first called Christians in Antioch. Because of the way they lived, because of the way they, they pushed the gospel out, people began to call them imitators of Christ, Christians. They were special people, had a special calling, just as even today we are special people, God's people, and we have a special calling to go to the ends of the earth, to focus not on ourselves, the comfort and the conveniences of our members, but on a lost and dying and hurting world outside these four walls. That's who we are. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, wrote in his uh, piece entitled uh, Letters, from, uh, Le- Letters and Papers from Prison, He said, the church is the church only when it exists for others. Now, you you might disagree with him, but but you would be wrong, as a professor used to tell me. (laughs) The church is the church only when it exists for others. Not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live for Christ. That's why we exist. That's why we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world because we'd be out there serving and loving and touching, taking the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the darkness that surrounds us. So at First Baptist Church Statesboro, during these 100 days of prayer, we need to examine where is our focus. Are we focused on the comfort and conveniences of our members? Or are we focused on the darkness and the lostness and the brokenness That's not just across the globe, but that's right across the street where you live. Well, let's examine several things. Uh, One thing to examine to determine our focus is look at our buildings and our property. Do our buildings and our property and how we use them and why we build them, and does that say we have a focus on ourselves or does it say we have a focus on others? It would... The way we open our buildings, uh, who gets the best parking spaces? How do people come in? You know, I I drove around the property a while back, and I counted 31 entrances to the church property. We have four floors. I have eight buildings on four floors. We do have four floors. We have an indoor graveyard. We got five fellowship halls. We got six kitchens. We have 125 commodes. But what do our buildings say we're focused on the comfort and the conveniences of ourselves, or are they tools that we use to penetrate the brokenness of a lost and dying world? Interesting question. That'd be a good dinner conversation uh, around the dinner table today. Question, a second thing to examine is our budget. Because of your generosity, 
Our church manages and spends, we spend almost every dollar you give us. <laughs> so if you give more, we'll spend more. <laughs> About $3 million. That's a lot of money for a church. But we were involved in missionaries, programs, events for kids, senior adults, community agencies. But when you examine our church budget, is it used for the comfort and conveniences of our members? Or is our church, are our resources used to penetrate the brokenness of a lost and dying world? A third thing to examine is our programs. we got lots of programs, don't we? I, mean, we? I mentioned not long ago, we have to have a special software program on our computers to track who's going where, what building, what activities, what events, you know, so we don't double book things. When you look at all the programming of our church, is it done for us? Or is our church programming done for them? And the last thing to examine is the personnel. We've got about eight staff ministers We've got a number of office staff. We have a housekeeping staff, maintenance staff. We've got a food services staff. And we have a lot of staff members here. Indeed, half of our budget pays for our staff, our personnel. Well, do we hire personnel and engage them and empower them to help this, this church get outside the four walls and engage the community around us? Or do we hire staff and expect them to care for the comfort and the conveniences of us? Because after all, we pay the bill, Right? What's the role of the personnel? Do we have an inward focus, taking care of one another? Or like in the book of Acts, do we want to get the story of Jesus in places it's never gone before? There's three things I've learned as a pastor in my 35 years. Uh, Today is our 35th wedding anniversary, but I've been a pastor uh, four weeks longer than I've been a husband. (laughs) And so 35 years of pastoring, I've learned three truths uh, that that, that apply. One truth is... It is easy to focus on ourselves. It's easy. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? If you want a unanimous vote in a Baptist church, let me tell you how to get it. Now, some of y'all weren't raised Baptist. Some of you came from a Catholic background, other denominations. Maybe this is the first Baptist church you've ever been a part of. But some of you were raised Baptist, and you know this is true. If you want to get a unanimous vote, there's only one way to get a unanimous vote, it seems like, is that present something that's for the comfort and, conve- comfort and conveniences of everybody involved, and everybody's going to vote for that. Amen. It's going to help me, serve me. I'm in favor of that. <laughs> it's easy to take care of yourself. If you want a unanimous vote, do something for the comfort and the conveniences of those in the pews. Everybody supports that. It's easy to focus on ourselves. A second truth I've learned is that it is comfortable to focus on ourselves. You get in the zone. You know, it's good times. You know, you got the get-togethers. You have social events. You entertain one another. You love one another. You eat together. You can do a lot of wonderful things, have a lot of fun, go on a lot of trips, do a lot of great things. It's very comfortable, very comfortable to focus on ourselves. But a third lesson I've learned as a pastor is that when you focus on yourself to the exclusion of a lost and dying world, it is sinful to focus on ourselves. Jesus said, we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them and teach them to observe what I've commanded you. He said, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem right where you are and a little farther in Judea, a little farther than Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. Don't keep it to yourself, Jesus says. And so when we keep it to ourselves and when we circle the wagons and we want to focus on the comfort and the conveniences of our members to the exclusion of a lost and hurting and broken world, when we ignore the clear clarion call of Christ, it is a sin in the face of God. So why do we focus outward? Because of who we are. We are the body of Christ sharing the gospel story of Jesus. A second reason why we, uh, uh, the healthy church, need to focus outward is, is not only because of who we are, but because of who they are, meaning the world out there. This community around us. This church was established on the first Sunday of 1882. We've been here a long, long time. Long, long time. And, uh, but re- do you think God knew what this community would look like when he founded this church in 1882? 
You know, sometimes we, we look at Bill account and think, my, my, look at all that going on. Imagine God sitting on the throne of the universe saying, wow, look at what's happening in Bullock County. <laughs> or maybe God knew that, so he planted this church here 136 years ago. For such a time as this, these Christians in Antioch, they had a great story to tell. They knew that the story, the gospel of Jesus had changed their life, and they wanted to change other people's lives. They had a heart for a lost and dying world, both near and far. And, and they, they weren't going to keep it to themselves. Uh, William Temple was a former Archbishop of Canterbury. It's not often I get to quote an Anglican uh, minister, but today's a good day. <laughs> and this, uh, you could laugh at that, no problem. I mean, thanks for nothing. Uh, <laughs> uh, William Temple, the Archbishop, said, The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. I think this Anglican uh, bishop understood more than a lot of Baptists do. <laughs> the church is the only society that exists not for itself, but for those who are not even part of its members, for the world in which it lives. That's why he planted us here. Not just because of who we are, but because of who they are out there. And what we do in here ought to make a difference out there. So let me ask you some questions about uh, the people who are out there. The first question is, uh, do we know our community? How, how well do we know our community where God planted this church? Some of y'all been living here your whole life. Some of y'all, we moved here 14, going on almost 15 years ago. We love, we love Bullock County. Great place to live. I tell people when they move here, this is a great town. You're going to love it. You know, go ahead and burn your, burn your ships. No reason to go anywhere else. <laughs> Some of y'all brand new here, and you're still, well, I don't know about all this. Great, but how well do we know our communities? Let me ask four or five questions. Put them all there on the screen, if you don't mind. Is that Olivia up there? Olivia, put them all on the screen for me. The four questions, you'll be thinking about these. Who are the largest four employers in Bullock County? What is the racial ethnic composition? How many households are there in Bullock County? How many live below the poverty level? And what is the median age? How well do we know our community? All right, here's a test. All right, number one, who, who are the largest four employers? Now, everybody knows number one. Who's number one employer? Somebody shout it out. Go Eagles, right? <laughs> Georgia Southern University is the largest employer. Second largest employer is the Board of Education of Bullock County. The third largest employer is the county government, the Bullock County government. The fourth largest employer is the East Georgia Regional Medical Center. But understand this about Georgia Southern. Our largest employer, Georgia Southern University, Employ, if you take the top 10 list of employers, Georgia Southern employs more people than the entire top 10 list combined. Wow, think about that. What does it mean in our community, what does it mean for our church that a single employer employs more people than the rest of the top 10 employers combined? Interesting table discussion. <laughs> Question number two, what is the racial ethnic composition from the U.S. Census Bureau? These are rounded numbers. Anglo, Caucasian, non-Hispanic white is 67%. 67% Anglo, white, Caucasian. 28% African American in Bullock County. 3% Hispanic, Latino. And 1% Asian. So nearly a third of this community is uh, African-American or of an ethnicity, almost a full third. What does it mean for our church, moving forward to the days ahead, that one-third of our community is non-white? Might there be a day, might there be a day when our church calls an African-American minister because a full third, almost a third of our community is non-white? Interesting question. Next one is how many households are there? Well, I've shared this before. Maybe you know there's 26,000 households 
according to the U.S. Census Bureau. An average of like 2.9 people. I don't know who that 0.9 child is, but the 2.9 people runs up about 75,000 people that are in clustered of 26,000 households across Bullock County. And how many of our Bullock Countyans live below the poverty rate? It's just a little over 30%. 30% of people in Bullock County live below the poverty rate. But understand this, inside the city limits of Statesboro, inside the city limits of Statesboro, it's almost 51%. 50% of the people that live in the city of Statesboro live below the poverty level. What does it mean to our church that every other person in the city of Statesboro lives under the poverty level. Surely that must mean something when our city has half of its citizens living below the poverty level. And the last question is, what is the median age? Median basically means if you were to line everybody up, take the youngest baby on one end and line everybody up to the oldest adult. Who's the person in the middle? Who is, who, what age is that person in the middle? If the youngest baby is on that end of the line and the oldest adult at that end of the line, the, the person of the dead middle is age 27. That means there's as many people, understand this, there's as many people under the age of 27 in Bullock County as there are above the age of 27. Think about that. Some people think, well, that's because the university there. No, it's not because of the university because a lot of those university students register for the census back at home. It's because of those moms and dads who are in their late 20s, 30s, or 40s, but they still got three or four kids un, in their 20s or teens or at home because of the number of families that are here. Understand, what does it mean for our programs? What does it mean for our church? What does it mean for our future direction when there are as, as many people under the age of 27 as there are above the age of 27? Surely that ought to mean something. So the first question is, how well do we know our community? The second question when we think about Bullock County is, are we asking the right questions? If we're going to focus outwardly, are we asking the right questions? Now, we got all the right answers. Amen. The glory of God. We, the Bible, that's the right answers. But are we asking the right questions? And sometimes people don't care what answers you've got if you don't have the right questions. When that alcoholic parent has broken up his family, because he's addicted to, to alcohol or some substance abuse, what kind of questions is he asking? When that young woman is struggling after her abortion to find healing and sense and peace and forgiveness and grace, what kind of questions is she asking? When that parent who's lost a son or daughter in a drunk driving accident, what kind of questions are they asking? When that young man or woman is, is struggling with the gay lifestyle and really fighting against same-sex attractions and trying to figure out his or her sexual identity and what's right and what's wrong and why is it right and why is it wrong and who they are, what kind of questions are they asking? And when the non-believing, agnostic, atheist people drive up and down North and South Main Street, when they don't even look at this church property, when they don't even think about Jesus Christ, when they don't even care about eternity, what kind of questions are they asking? We've got the right answers, but are we asking the right questions? Given the lostness and brokenness that's all around us. And the third thing to ask is, are, are we speaking their language? You know, sometimes church folk speak in a way nobody understands except church folk. We talk about getting under the spout where the glory comes out. <laughs> but do they understand what that even means? Do you even understand what that means? We say, I've been, my sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. But do they know what that means? We, we even talk about Jesus is my Savior. Many people don't even know what it means to say Jesus is my Savior. Not that they don't accept. They don't know what that term means. Are we speaking their language? I was in a meeting this week. We are talking about some of the technical things with our live stream and computers and Internet. And uh, there was a bunch of us in the room, and they were talking all this uh, techno language kind of stuff. And one guy was talking, and I was at the end of the table, and I've learned if you don't speak, they think you know what you're, you're talking about. <laughs> I'd rather be silent, people think I'm smart, than open my mouth and, and prove them wrong. <laughs> They're talking about, well, we, we might need to have a, uh, 
um, H.264 MPEG div X rate. And I thought, yes, yes, I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what we need. And another guy chimed in and said, well, if, if we had different encoders, we could have a uh, bit rate per second and, and, and a megabit variable bit rate. I thought, yeah, I thought, yeah, you're right. That encoder. I don't have any idea what they're talking about. Does our community know what we mean when we say, I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do we know what we mean when we say we have fellowship? <laughs> Are we speaking their language? We've got the greatest story ever told in Jesus. Let's make sure the community knows and can understand the story we're telling. So why should we focus outwardly? It's because of who we are, and it's because of who they are. But most importantly, it's because of who Jesus is. That's why. Because of who Jesus is, our Master, Savior, King, Boss, Redeemer, Lord, because of who Jesus is, that's why we've got to tell the story to others. Remember in John chapter 20, 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. He was talking initially to Peter and John and, and Thomas and Bartholomew and the, the other disciples. But through the Scriptures, Jesus is talking to me and you. He says, I planted this church in Bullock County 136 years ago. And as the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. And then in John chapter 4, when he was teaching his disciples, he said, Behold, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. Look all around you. He says, They are white unto harvest. Now we think, uh, as, down here in South Georgia, we think of a cotton field, white unto harvest. But, but Jesus was probably t looking at a wheat field that, that he was getting to the bleach point, that it, it, was, it was past time. It was, it was ready. Somebody needed to go out in the field and get it. It was white. It was ready. It, it was bursting forth. There's a harvest. Do you believe all around us there is a harvest for us? A harvest of souls. A harvest of men and women, boys and girls and families. A harvest of people up and down Bullock County from Register to Stilson to Portal to Brooklyn to Statesboro and everywhere in between. People of empty lives and broken homes and marriages and hopeless circumstances filled with questions and doubt and uncertainty. Do you believe there's a harvest of souls? Do you see the harvest? And we are the body of Christ. We are the salt of the earth. We are to the light of the world, but the salt's got to get out of the salt shaker. The light's got to get out from under the basket. Let's put it on a stand so everybody can see it. Because the greatest work we will ever do, the greatest work this church will ever do in its 136 years of history is not what we do on Sunday morning in the safety of our sanctuaries and in the confines of our conveniences, but the greatest thing we'll ever do is not our Sunday school parties, it's not our Bible studies, it's not our programs and our activities, but the greatest thing this church will ever do for the glory of God is when it gets out into the highways and the byways and the grit and grime of people's lives, when we penetrate the darkness, we share the message of Jesus Christ, and we tell people about the life change message of the Lord Jesus because the harvest tells us to go and let's love our community let's touch our community let's serve our community let's make a difference in our community because if there is no harvest out there if there is no harvest of men and women boys and girls and families we might as well shut off the lights lock the doors and board up the windows because if there is no harvest out there then why are we wasting our time in here do you see the harvest and the story of Jesus is not meant to be kept to yourself. <laughs> so I finish with three personal questions. What, questions for me and questions for you. Number one, given the community in which we live, what am I willing to do? What am I willing to do? Maybe God during this hundred days of prayer is leading you to do something you've never done before. What's God leading you to do? You answer that for yourself. I'm having to answer it for me. Second question. Given this community, what am I willing to change in my life, in our congregation? Maybe it's something 10 years ago we weren't willing to change, but now we need to change. Now, we've talked about embracing change. Some things should never change. But what are we willing? What are we willing to change? And the third question, 
What am I willing to become? See, God's not finished with me. (laughs) He's still uh, shaping and stretching and growing me. God's not finished with you. And understand this, if God is working in our church, that means God's going to be working in me and God's going to be working in you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and the clear call of Christ that pushes us outward. May we be faithful to do and be and become all that you've called us to. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.